Hello and welcome to the first lecture of INT 1101 and today we'll be addressing the scientific method and as you'll notice uh, this year uh, the lecture on the scientific method is lecture one normally it's lecture two uh, and sometimes lecture three it depends a bit on uh, the availability of guest professors that will be teaching the other lectures in this case our guest lecture of next week Professor Cyrus Moody wasn't available this week so we switch the sequence around a little bit this may result in you not really grasping the connection between the lectures and the tutorials yet but that is something that takes time anyway and uh, the course is designed in such a way that we offer you an online uh, version of the lectures every Tuesday and then on Friday we'll have a Q&A where we script through the lecture in group and you can ask us questions and because the first lecture is actually given by me Kasper Rissels I'm the coordinator of INT 1101 we'll also address some time about uh, focusing on the general goal of the course what do we, we want you to learn in this course and also uh, what are the assignments what are uh, what is the policy on late work what is the policy on attendance requirements but today uh, the scientific method now the scientific method is a, is a philosophical concept or a concept that is aimed at describing science and distinguishing science from non-science and this is what we call in the philosophy of science the demarcation problem so the demarcation the division between science and non-science now we know that science stems from latin from the word scientia which means knowledge and we know that science is a field right it's professional people doing science trying to investigate stuff uh, trying to gain new knowledge and try to advance society try to advance science and as a result society in that manner in addition it's also a culture because the professionals working in science all have a sort of a similar mentality right sort of a similar idea on how they should approach knowledge and how they should build that knowledge so it's a group of individuals that shares a common interest and also an educational background it is in a way it's a way of life although obviously science is done uh, in, in, in different manners all over the world uh, it's still very characteristic uh, the way that scientists approach a certain problem that is what we call the scientific method so it's also a way of getting to the truth and and these different people they actually form sort of, sort of a cultural group that tries to do or tries to gain knowledge in a certain way which is defined as the philosophical concept of the scientific method now if we do some myth busting and we analyze what science is what people tend to think about science is that science is a thing that aims at providing us with a body of knowledge so what science tries to do is build knowledge so that we understand the problem in a better way and that's true that's actually a myth about science that is actually true and we know that science is both a process and a source of knowledge so it's a source of knowledge for other people to build upon so to, to explain to people how something works, and they can then take that knowledge into account and make decisions in their lives but it's also a process to gain more knowledge and, and that knowledge being a source of other knowledge again so what we try to do in science in the process of science is transform isolated facts into coherent theories and laws in order to understand the natural world so we uh, as humans are, are very skeptical very curious we want to understand the natural world and science is a way of explaining what's going on in the natural world, but also a way of discovering what's going on in the natural world, in the natural world and, and gaining knowledge through making theories and laws and we'll discuss that a bit more in in this course because in this course will mainly focus at the process right like not like philosophically or in this in this in this lecture I mean not in the course but in this lecture we'll focus mainly on the method how do we get to uh, to uh, knowledge creation rather than how do we behave as scientists well if you look at the method from a zoomed out perspective uh, very much like other endeavors in, in society science is a process that starts with a combination of divergent thinking and convergent thinking well when you start studying a topic you try to get as much information as you can then try to make sense by distilling that somehow into a decision point and in science it kind of looks like this right you start with a topic like you want to explore a certain physical phenomenon and you start trying to gain as much information that's already available on this topic 
by reasoning with other scientists, <clears throat> by studying literature, analyzing possibilities, alternative, different points of view, and, and discussing with each other. And then you try to come up with some more defined uh, points that you should study, hypotheses, like explanations, okay, this is the information we have, so it might work like this. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to do experiments, you're going to start evaluating your, your hypotheses, seeing, testing your hypotheses, and seeing if they're true. And then in the end, you'll compare, okay, did my hypothesis explain the phenomenon or not? Is this okay to build a theory like that? This is your decision point. Now, this is a very zoomed out, very uh, general way of looking at science, and it's not really solely something that you only encounter in science. For instance, in educational settings, it's very similar, right? If you do a PBL, you can see that you approach a problem in the same manner, right? You start reading the text, coming up, okay, what, what is the problem statement that we have here? You start brainstorming and clustering to get as much information and you start distilling learning goals. These learning goals you test at home by studying literature and then you come in post-discussion and you talk about um, what, what you learned that day. And that's your decision point. Now, the scientific method always starts with a question. You want to know something, you want to gain information on something, and you want an answer to a question. For instance, why do swimming organisms often have the shape of a fish? Why does the fish has the shape of a fish? Well, the fish shape potentially is hydrodynamic, and through natural selection, this made fish uh, evade their predators more easily, and that's why most fish have the same shape. A less scientific question can be, do time and place of birth influence my life? You can look at that from a sociological point of view and then it is scientific, or you can do something more spiritual and state that the placement of planets at the time and place you were born do influence your personality. So a horoscope, for instance. So this shows you that science is very similar to other uh, ways in society that we look for truth. But there's a specific way of doing things. For instance, and again, can highly diluted substances cure me? Yes, water remembers the healing power of a substance. This refers to homeopathy, of course, which will be in the debates. And you, you see that, like, also forms of, of non-scientific endeavors called pseudoscience that resemble science somehow, or even non-scientific endeavors like, like spirituality and, and, and um and religion, for instance, uh, try to find answers to, to questions that people have, but they approach problems in a slightly different manner. It starts with a question, but still science is a bit different from other forms of looking for knowledge, let's say. Science doesn't start with a question, it starts with a hypothesis, something you want to prove or disprove. And that's kind of different to what you have in, in, in non-scientific uh, forms of truth and religion, you don't necessarily want to design a hypothesis, God is real, and then test that hypothesis, right? In science you do. For instance, a hypothesis should be something and should explain something about the phenomenon you're researching. It should suggest an event, right? For instance, chemical reaction rate will increase with temperature. There should also be a relationship between two variables. Taking notes in class will increase my knowledge retention increasing the chemical reaction rate will increase with temperature. There should be a cause-effect relationship. For instance, smoking can cause lung cancer, and it can be one-sided or two-sided. Intensively doing sports will influence your body weight positively as you burn more calories, but you can also build if you have, uh, if you couple um, your, your uh, physical activity to more dietary intake, you can build muscle and that that's how it can be two-sided, although this is probably not the best example. So now we have our hypothesis, and now we should test it. And that's where the scientific method comes in, right? Like we explained before, you have an observation of a phenomenon, you want to explain how the phenomenon works. So you start observing it, you start gathering information, and through reasoning you create an hypothesis. This is how I think that this works. So you design an experiment and you make a prediction. Okay, if I do this type of experiment, I can prove uh, that my hypothesis is real and the data will look like this. And then if you do the experiment, the data actually do look like this. You build evidence that indeed your hypothesis was correct. So you gain knowledge. 
However, if the data don't match prediction, that's also science, right? That also happens, that something is not going according to plan. And this can mean that your hypothesis was wrong, your experiment was wrong. So what you do is you redesign your experiment, you try again, and if that still doesn't match the prediction, you start thinking why. And you start revising your hypothesis and do the same thing again. Now this is obviously a little bit abstract. So let's get into a more specific example. Let's say that the phenomenon you're studying is that you notice, okay, the more moist it is in a certain room, the more likely it is that microbe, uh, microbes start growing in that room. So your hypothesis can be, just by studying a certain phenomenon, moisture must influence microbial growth. Okay, so you're going to do an experiment where you increase uh, the amount of relative humidity in a room and you're going to see how microbes grow in that room. And your prediction is prob pro probably based on, on your initial observations that in that experiment we'll see a positive correlation between water activity and microbial growth. So there will be a positive correlation between both variables. Well, if you do that experiment, then indeed, you'll see that once you uh, increase the water content in a room from 0%, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%, nothing really grows. But if you continue increasing the water content in a room to 60, 70%, you still see not really grow, although we know for now that, that also some fungi have enough water content at 60, 70% to start growing, but they're not really, it's not really easy to quantify that growth using uh, conventional uh, compendia testing procedures. Then if, but if the water content starts rising above 70, 80, 90, or even 100, even towards 100%, you'll see that first most molds will start growing, then yeasts, and eventually even gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So. You start analyzing, okay, I had a prediction about my hypothesis, mainly that moisture will influence uh, my microbial growth and that the higher the water content is in a room or in, in, a, in a certain environment, the more microbes will grow. So then you check the data from your experiment and indeed your prediction was correct. So your data matched your prediction. Does that mean that your hypothesis is proved? No, not really. So a hypothesis is never really proven until it's really disproven factually, but you build up evidence and the data supports your hypothesis and provides proof for it. And the more proof you gather, the more likely it is that your hypothesis is actually true. Now, very quickly, the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction can sometimes be difficult and we'll see in the second part of the lecture why that is, uh, but in, in the normal, normal, non-statistical uh, scientific method, the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction is that a hypothesis is a potential explanation to how something works. So it's more general. While the prediction is assuming that my hypothesis is indeed correct, and I do an experiment, what will my data look like? What would my experimental data look like? So that is the, the difference, and it can be really, really like different, uh, difficult to assess the difference between both specifically in statistical analysis, but in, in, in the usual more uh, factual way of doing the scientific method, the more general way, there is a difference between hypothesis and prediction. You should take that in mind. Now, another myth commonly associated with science is that a hypothesis, once you get more and more proof uh, and get more and more proof that, that, that it is correct, will automatically lead to a theory and then eventually scientific law. Now, this is one myth that is not true. Uh, in science and outside science is a common mis misconception. And of course, the more hypotheses you test, the more uh, information you gain about a certain phenomenon, the easier it becomes to, to build theories. And if you get more factual information, you can even like have singular statements uh, called laws about a certain phenomenon, but they're not always necessarily connected and there's not necessarily a natural transition from one to the other. Hypotheses are far more abundant or just crazy things you test, crazy ideas, crazy explanations about some theories you have, and, and they are very likely to be created and tested. And, and theories are, are more elaborate or more uh, of combination of, of, of a lot of like uh, factual data on a certain phenomenon while laws are, are even different and or even more factual and, and more singular statements about something. Now, 
I think that there's a, a nice YouTube video you can find in the link below where uh, somebody that's much better explaining this difference between between these two uh, these three uh, concepts we have in the scientific method than I am, uh, and I, I would advise you to watch the YouTube link. Thank you for your attention. See you in the next part of the lecture.